who am I? Richard Casimer, media veteran. Why I got in radio is because I'm good with a knife. Contributor in Perth, Australia. Our friend Richard Casimer in the United States. Uh, how are you guys enjoying the 19th century? Is that working out for you? How can you say, I'm not making fun of you as a race, I'm making fun of you as black performers? I think as a country, Americans are as patriotic as the most rabid UK football hooligan. Who am I? Richard S. Casimer. Radio with Phil Dobby. We talked about uh, the stuff up in the execution of uh, Charles Warner in Oklahoma last week on the program. Uh, it was a very slow death scene, and the whole thing has put back basically well in in his case i think they've put the whole thing back six months but it's delaying other executions now death row in the united states is starting to look like pam at a road at rush hour uh so richard kasma what's happening here yes indeed on the heels of last week's botched execution by lethal injection of convicted murderer clayton lockett who's another cog in the wheel here the state of oklahoma granted a six-month stay for the uh, execution of convicted rapist and murderer charles warner this is all while the prison officials investigate whether the current method of execution is indeed safe and humane, which is a little oxymoronic. As we mentioned previously on Balls Radio, Mr. Lockett's execution went wrong when the intravenous tube into his vein had fallen out and no one noticed it. Now, what happened was that the delivery of the sedation drug that goes in before the two-drug compound that actually kills him, that never went into him. The execution was stopped when they found Mr. Lockett writhing in pain. He died from the residual effect a few minutes minutes later of a heart attack. Very painful. Well, when that happened, it made national headlines and Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon delayed Mr. Warner's execution for another six months. What's added more fodder, Phil, to this whole debate against capital punishment here in the United States is the revelation that Mr. Lockett was tasered on the morning of his execution for refusing to leave his cell. He also cut himself while he was in there. And also the IV drip was inserted in his groin rather than in his arm. And that added to the problem because the officials there who were conducting the execution couldn't see that it had fallen out of his groin. That's not ordinary for that procedure of lethal injection. Well, what's happened is Mary Fallon, the governor of Oklahoma, she's appointed the Oklahoma Commissioner of Public Health to investigate the matter. The lawyers, the defense attorneys for death row inmates, they're crying foul. They're saying, no, they want an independent person to look into this whole matter. But it just throws capital punishment here in the United States back into the limelight where it mm. should be. And perhaps the 32 states that actually have capital punishment on the books may re-examine that. Well, I mean, when you start talking about the most humane way, the most humane way to kill someone, I mean, come on. I mean, what? I mean, you might as well just give them a rope and say, look, we're, we're just going to leave this in this room with you. Uh, I noticed there's a hook in the ceiling. Uh, up to you now. I mean, you know, I mean, which, which would be a slow way to die. Lots of people do it. It's not humane. But there's no humane way, is there? Anyway. No, there isn't. And the bottom line is that economically, there's a lot of debate, but economically, fiscally, it costs more money to execute a prisoner than it does to sentence that person to life imprisonment without parole. When you look at if you've got, uh, you know, X amount of hundreds or thousands of people in a federal prison, to have one more person in there for life does not really add to the economic impact of that. But whether when you have somebody who's on death row for months and years at a time facing appeal after appeal, those legal costs and the st- costs that the state has to pay to counter that appeal adds up far more than, than having someone in prison for the rest of their life. And the other thing, too, is you go to prison as punishment, not for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well in theory, absolutely. I wonder how the, the relatives of the the victims of these crimes if it's i'm sure it's more than likely it's a murder that they're in there for and they that they're, they're being put down for but i wonder i wonder whether the relatives are actually feel happy about that are they getting closure or do they feel uh, as though it's wrong as well it, i suspect a lot of them are thinking yeah i don't actually want to see another human being die for this i can only imagine what it's like to be on that end of being the family of a victim of, of a heinous crime you know when you hear about the people in when when a convicted murderer is sentenced that i think that you know it's it's either a 50 50 split or even more more so on the other side of people saying 
I would rather that you suffer for the rest of your life. The closure doesn't come when someone mm. is executed because then they're done and it's over with. As morbid as it may sound, there is more of a closure knowing that that person is suffering in for eternity. Prison, yeah, suffering yeah. for eternity. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. It's a strange thing. Maybe maybe a more humane way would be to let people choose how they're going to die. So, for example, yep, you can be, uh, we, can, we can drown you, we can chuck you out of an airplane, we can chuck you off a very large cliff, um, you know, add a little bit of color to the whole thing uh now <laughs> ben not a good idea i can tell by your silence so you don't think that's a good idea uh benghazi is in the news the u.s embassy or uh should i say the diplomatic mission i think it is in benghazi uh was attacked of course in 2012 uh the republicans don't feel as though the truth has been told so they pushed through legislation for an investigation into into the attack two years down the track obviously politics at play here isn't there yes and if insanity is defined as doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different <laughs> result, then the U.S. Republican Party's word for it is Benghazi, as you say. Now, in preparation for this November's midterm elections, the GOP is once again amping up its multi-defeated battle cry of Benghazi. And as you said, in reference to the 2012 terrorist attack of the U.S. Embassy in Benghazi, Libya, that saw the death of U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other Americans. This is all fueled by the release of the anti-Muslim YouTube video that was made here in the United States that that's what was the direct cause and effect of that attack on that embassy. Tasked with this dog and pony show is Representative Trey Gowdy. He's a South Carolina Republican who looks and sounds like a cross between Julian Assange and the banjo kid from Deliverance. To date, the Republicans have conducted, get this, Phil, 13 hearings, 50 briefings, and generated 25,000 pages of documents, all with the same result, full exoneration of any incompetence or neglect on the part of then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice, the Pentagon, and President Obama. Active and retired military officials and the CIA to a person have all agreed nothing was foreseen that could have predicted or prevented the attack. And yet the GOP continues this witch hunt for the sole reason that the midterm elections are coming up this November and they are desperate for a campaign platform. That is oh. it. Right. And if they can get Hillary Clinton in the process, all the better, I guess. Exactly, because they are deathly afraid that she's going to run in 2016. And right now, her poll numbers show that she would defeat any Republican candidate down the line. So they are fearful of that. The other thing is that the Republicans have failed to repeal the hugely successful Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. They have not introduced a single jobs bill in six years. They've blocked the national minimum wage increase. So they have nothing but to go back to the constituents except to say, well, we, we've got Benghazi. We'll find the truth on this. There yeah. is no there there. So in the Washington Post, I noticed there's an article uh, yesterday, I think it was, or so, sometime over the weekend, saying that Benghazi is now mentioned by Republicans more than Obamacare. So it is. It's sort of like, well, on to the next thing. Uh, 72 mentions uh, during speeches in the past eight days uh, from on Benghazi by the Republicans. There's blood on their hands and they're going to make money off of it because they have lost the Obamacare battle. Their constituents are seeing that Obamacare works for them. More of their constituents now have affordable insurance and comprehensive insurance that were either underinsured or not insured heretofore. So this is the only thing that they have to go on. And it remains to be seen whether or not their constituents are, are stupid enough to fall for it. Now, on to important stuff. There's talk of dropping the drinking age, because in, in many states, of course, it's uh, it's 21 years. I, I don't know. How do you get through college without drinking? I, I don't know how people manage to do it. it. I mean, that's part of the education process, isn't it? It's getting sloshed uh, and finding a way home in the, in the dead of night. I, and obviously, Americans not going through that experience. Well, it's been 30 years since the national drinking age was up from 19 to 21. And that was due in large part to an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. There's been a mild call to action by some civil rights group to lower the age back to 18, citing the age-old pro-drinking meme, if someone is old enough to fight and die for the country, they're old enough to decide if they want to drink or not. Neglecting the reality that the fight and die analogy that a soldier in active military duty applies, it does not. If you're in a soldier in, in the U.S. military, you do not have the right to decide whether you drink or not. You're told 
when and where to go at all times. So you can't be drinking in your barracks. So that whole thing doesn't apply. Now, even before the 1984, when they j- jumped it up to 21 years of age, 20 states already had regulations designating 21 years of age as the legal drinking limit. So it's 21 and, years. So it's 21 years everywhere across the United States. Then yes, it is. Now there some states will have an appeasement to it or an easement on it. Like you can drink at a restaurant. You could have one drink at a restaurant if you're accompanied by adults if you're (laughs) under the age of 21 but in general you have to be 21 years old to buy and consume alcohol so so you could get married of course at 18 uh, and (laughs) what a great reception that's going to be uh thanks for being here if you could now uh, lift your glasses a glass of lemonade that is uh to toast the bride and groom yeah i mean (laughs) yeah yeah the case has been made that countries with younger drinking ages or no ages for drinking have no higher rate of alcoholism than the united states But the empirical data here benefits the 21-year-old age limit. That's undisputable. National Institutes of Health surveys time after time show that anyone who began drinking in their early teens were not only at a greater risk of developing drinking and alcohol dependence, they were also greater risk of developing dependences more quickly and developing chronic and relapsing dependences. There's also proof that the 21 drinking age limit has saved highway fatality lives year after year in the 30-year period. So all of that data is there. And now to bring it down to, let's say, 18, I don't think it's ever going to happen. You will see a spike in people under the age of 18 being supplied alcohol by people who are 18 years old, as we did when it was at 21. You see 21-year-olds buying alcohol for people who are 20 to 18. I don't think you want to have kids in middle school getting the alcohol purchased by people who are 18 years old. Mm. And what Uh, you said, too, about the colleges, Phil, that private colleges... So you're you're all for this. You think sticking it at 20, keeping it at 21, is a good idea by the, by the way you're talking absolutely mm. yeah so and, and what you said about colleges is that colleges <laughs> here in the united states private colleges they can prohibit students drinking on campus as well as off campus regardless of if the person is is of legal age even if a student travels abroad if their chaperones or professors see someone who is drinking alcohol that'll go on their record so the colleges over here are not uh, the private colleges at least so make are. their own rules <clears throat> This is a clear sign of where America and Australia and the UK are culturally so different, and, and, and probably a lot of other countries as well. To the idea that you're not drinking at 18 seems uh, seems very, very bizarre. Uh, and I can't believe that kids aren't doing it, even though it's against the law. I can't believe that they're not, uh, as you say, getting other people to buy drinks for them. Oh, they are. I'm just saying that it's, <laughs> it's against the rules. I'm not saying right. they're not. They are right. indeed. And binge drinking on college campuses is a huge problem over here. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what that's what happens you see if it's out in the open then perhaps there's less uh, tendency to binge drink although as i say that of course i don't believe the words that are coming out of my mouth because i just think of my university years were uh, filled with binge drinking <laughs> i'm sure they it's are the liquor talking, going through, you know, it's the liquor talking. it's the liquor now uh post office losses uh the post office over there is losing money the post office here is losing money canada is uh, talking about dropping deliveries uh, altogether you have to go and pick up your post uh, um, so, uh, but and they're pushing up the price of FedEx in in the United States. Mm-hmm. Good news for good news for Amazon. They're saying yes, FedEx, formerly known as Federal Express, which is neither federal or express, unless you want to pay a higher fee to expedite your shipping. Well, they announced this week they're going to be upping their shipping prices to adjust for the space of the package that it takes up, not just the weight. This generated some fear and loathing among the online shoppers, such as Amazon.com, that they may have to raise their prices as well because Amazon uses FedEx and they offer free two-day shipping of components of your order. So if your order has several parts to it, they won't just send the several parts in one box. They'll send it in several oversized boxes. Why? I don't know, but they get free shipping. Well, now that FedEx is upping the price, there's fear that Amazon will have to up their price. UPS, the United Parcel Service, which is not to be confused with the USPS, the United States Postal Service, they're also expected to jack up its rates as well confused but, me too yeah, but basically everything is going up in price but you still get um so the the postal service uh, still delivers letters every yes. day yeah 
And is yeah. the talk is the talk over there that they're going to reduce that? Because here now they're saying, well, maybe we'll reduce it to uh, three days a week, uh, and perhaps we're also going to charge you uh, to receive letters, which is interesting. Because straight away uh, I'll go right. Well, most of mine are bills, uh, so what, I, I just don't think I'll pay that money to, <laughs> to receive bills in the post. The uh, United States Postal Service has been hemorrhaging money at a rate of about twenty five million dollars a day. Now a lot of that is in large part due to the Republican Congress back in two thousand and six. They enacted what's called the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. And that required that the Postal Service begin pre-funding the health care benefits to future retirees 50 years in advance. And that took the money immediately out of the U.S. Postal Service's coffers. And it cost them $5.6 billion in the very first year. So that's why they're losing money. Also, it's hard for them to compete with FedEx and UPS, but they do a hell of a job. Every few years, they'll raise the price of postage. They are talking about cutting off uh, Saturday delivery. They don't deliver on Sunday. And they'll close some of the smaller or the less efficient post offices around the country. But why the GOP did this, it was during a GOP uh, Congress, is that because they're pro-business, the GOP, they wanted to kind of eliminate another government-supported agency for the benefit of private companies like FedEx and UPS. Those two companies, by the way, do not deliver to remote rural areas like the U.S. Postal Service has done since 1639. So that's the, the issue. It is a public good. Isn't it? And uh, and uh, you know you've got to you've got to, you've got to maintain it because otherwise, what does happen? You just don't have post. You get parcels, but you don't have post. And do we all around the world we're hitting this issue? And surely the only answer is the government has got to subsidise it, or we say goodbye to it. And can you imagine if if a private company said we have a bill for you, we have a utility bill for you, and in order for you to pick it up, you're going to have to pay us to come and pick up your bill. Somebody can't afford it. The bill doesn't get paid. The utility gets shut off because a private company charged a person, yeah. whereas the Postal Service would have delivered it to that person free of charge or just with the postal rate from the utility company. So that's what we're getting to is that it's all private that runs everything over yeah. here. All right. Now, the big four banks in Australia have announced uh, profits of, in the last six months, $14.7 billion. Now, you know, that's small money in the scheme of things, but it's about $1,000 or about $1,200 per man, woman and child in this country. Uh, that's just the profit the banks are making, just the big four. Um, makes bank fees seem worthwhile, doesn't it? Now we know they're making so much money. Uh, but, you know, if we want to see, of course, how big the rich-poor gap is, uh, we just need to look to America uh, and uh, <laughs> how people are making money out of money over there. And it's quite astounding, it seems. Nobel Prize winning economist and op-ed columnist Paul Krugman. I love this guy. He, 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 you either love him or hate him, but he is always right. And that's why people can't stand this guy. He is so brilliant. He had this wonderful New York Times piece and he was commenting on the institutional investors alpha magazine list of the 25 highest paid hedge fund managers. Seems that these guys raked in $21 billion last year. That's billion with a B. 25 people. 20, 25 people. 21 raked in billion. $21 billion dollars combined. Did they get their hands dirty making? it? No. Did they invent something? Hell no. They pushed somebody else's money from over here to over there and they made a pant load of commission in the process. And now, if you're like me and had never had two nickels to rub together, this is what hedge fund is. Hedge fund is defined as the often extra risky, extra volatile investment vehicle that demands huge upfront investments, sometimes in the millions. And they're not just for any investor. Oh, no, Phil. Only accredited investors can get involved in these hedge funds. These are people who generally earn upwards to $200,000 a year and have more than a couple of million dollars in the bank that they can afford to to lose that's what these guys do that's what a hedge fund manager does they take somebody else's money dip yeah. it into another company and they make a huge commission off well it. here's the key thing it is a risk i mean they're playing a risky game but they're playing a risky game with other people's money uh so they're not really the ones feeling the hurt no it's not but and, and why is this making big news it's because it, it goes to further prove the huge disparity of income inequality in america not that making money is and should be a crime it's just the fact that our current tax system rewards those who pay little or nothing on the millions they make by doing little or nothing whereas those who make little for doing real work have to pay more in taxes and that is what is repugnantly immoral over here and we're constantly looking for change but again the tax laws 
favor the people who have more money. The difference between the haves and the have-nots, the haves also are the want-mores. And in order to get more, they've got to have the have-nots make less. So yeah. and it just keeps and has, going And that's been... And everyone talks about, you know, you've got to have tax. You've got to have a, a low tax as an incentive because if you're if you're earning a billion dollars, obviously we need to incentivize you to earn to earn another billion dollars so you can. Uh, I don't know what you do with two billion dollars a year rather than a billion dollars a year, but I mean we've got to incentivize you with, with low taxes so you can keep on uh, raping and pillaging. But we don't have to go uh, too far back, like the seventies. Okay, little way back, but taxes were way higher, and they were particularly far more uh, progressive taxes you were you were paying a much more tax at the top end and that was the case in the states it was the case in the uk it was the case in australia mm -hmm. we seem to have abandoned that idea i mean I, you know we were paying over 50 percent tax in the in the top tax bracket in those days uh, yeah. and we seem to have thrown that, that that idea away because that was seen as a as a disincentive like if you look i'm, I'm not going to earn a billion dollars because i'm going to get taxed too heavily yeah like well there was that thought that the people that had the money were the job creators and what we yeah. saw was Doesn't especially happen. Especially after the 70s, that, that they didn't invest the money in creating more American jobs. They invested it in foreign companies with a lower minimum wage. And that's what's happened is that the rich, that whole myth is gone. The, the rich are not job creators. They're investors in low wage jobs that are already being done by people who are too poor to fight back. So that's that whole trickle down has never applied. And this country is coming around and seeing it, whether or not anything is done about it. Uh, because Congress and the Senate here in the United States are, are staffed by more people who are millionaires and billionaires than uh, the Caribbean or, or Monaco. Oh, by the way, Phil, is this too early to ask for a raise? <laughs> it's way too early to ask for a raise. I, I trickle down, though. I love the I love the term because even if it is happening, it is happening as a trickle. Uh, so small that we're not even seeing it. So, uh, so the expression was right from the very beginning. But as you say, it's it's just not happening, is it? Uh, you and I, brother, I believe is your expression. Uh, <laughs> we see eye to eye on this. Richard Casmo, good to talk. We'll see you again next week. All right, Phil. Take care. Balls Radio with Phil Dobby.